everybody. Uh, quite a few things on the bill tonight. What I've got up there is the Nixon shock chart for a, because we're going to be talking about fiat currency. So this was for 1971. Exact date I'll tell you in a second. This was when they abandoned the gold standard. So what this vlog is about, I'm going to be referring to a fascinating article that I'll refer you all to. It's about 13 pages long if you print it out, but I want to highlight a couple of issues. It perfectly de uh, describes how with fiat currency, there's always going to be war and there's always going to be a collapse. It's almost baked in. So that means we are heading for some sort of collapse and we are heading for some sort of war. It's just part of the whole scenario, which I'll go on to describe. And it also explains in this article why the Great Reset or Build Back Better is actually an amalgamation of Marx Hegel. So just to kick off, I will just go over to this chart which is Nixon shock chart. I told you I'd tell you the exact date. It was August, 15 August, 1971, Washington DC time, 9 PM. What I love about this chart is Pisces rising, which I think, you know, Pisces not built on a solid foundation. It's all a fantasy. It's illusory. It's built on nothing. It's fantasy money. It's a pyramid scheme. Wonderful analogy for that. The whole fiat currency is almost kind of uh, set up to fail and set up to explode because the ruler of Pisces there, Neptune, is conjunct Jupiter in Scorpio, which indicates to me massive, massive inflation because Jupiter, especially in Scorpio, explodes everything it touches. So um, those two in conjunction, well, we also are going to have a Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces, as you know, in April. So, you know, watch out for that time period because it maps in with, with this. I mean, it was born at the time of Jupiter-Neptune, got another one coming up, although different signs, right? Because it's in Pisces now. Interesting that both Pluto and Uranus are here in the house of war and Mars is conjunct the North Node because fiat currencies are synonymous with war. So, I'm going to be, you know, highlighting that topic quite extensively. If we have a look here, you can see solar arc Uranus. It's conjunct Mercury at the moment. Mercury ruling the fourth house, the foundations. They shifting, as I say, it's built on a bed of sand. And also rules, okay, that's Gemini on the descendant. And also rules here, house of war. So Uranus aggravating that by solar arc definitely indicates that some fundamental changes are going to be happening to the currencies. Um, we can look at this chart more. That's not really the purpose of this particular vlog. So I'll just pop back to this page. Now, what I was thinking, when they teach you history at school, you learn might learn about the War of the Roses, the Boer War. You might learn about um, the Byzantines fighting the Persians, whichever time in history. You'll learn about wars and they always focus on this side versus that side. They never ask the question, who funded the war. Soldiers have to be paid, they have to be fed, you have to buy your munitions, wars cost money. So it's really the financiers egging these wars on, aren't they? If they if they withheld the money, no war. But the financiers throughout history love to lend to kings because kings can tax the people to pay it back. And wars are fantastic because both warring nations get massively in debt and at the end things have to be rebuilt. So masses of money. I mean, wasn't it until 2005 the uh, UK was still paying America back for the war bonds, for the war debt. So it's massively, these wars are fantastic. It's destruction, which they love. It's moving the pieces on the global chessboard, like as a big new Brzezinski said. It's all just perfect for the globalists. And as I say, a lot of money for the financiers. And the other thing I want to say about war is they can change the trajectory of the war. They either extend credit or draw back credit to to shift the balance of whoever's winning, whoever's not winning. And then they can use the same people who usually control the media. So as we saw with World War II, the Americans were initially fed all sorts of news to make them pro-German, and then it swift, switched to all sorts of news to make them pro the United Kingdom and to bring America in. So the media will you know, influence the public opinion in other countries about war as well. Just on this note, you know, we always hear, and I was also guilty of this, being really proud of winning the war and how it was done and liberating Europe, but oh, it didn't happen, did it? Because while France and, and Belgium, Holland, whatever, Germany, Poland were liberated from the Nazis, the rest of Eastern, Eastern Europe was handed over to a tyrant that was every bit as bad, as ruthless, who had also concentration camps, gulags, Pretty much the same stuff going on, except it lasted an awful lot longer. So we handed 
half of Europe over to those tyrants. So it wasn't really achieving very much. If we went into the war to save Poland, it wasn't safe. That was the pretext, going in on behalf of Poland. And yet Poland was handed over to the ruthless Stalinists who went in there and mass murdered in Katinka Forest, which was not a lot of talked about. Um, in most Eastern European countries, the intelligentsia were lined up and shot. So it really, it, it wasn't a success story at all. Um, just to say, I mentioned on my, I did a virtute uh, video the other day where I talked about how to win this war and one thing that I forgot to mention is the last thing anyone should be doing is signing up for the army. These are not patriotic wars. None of these wars are for the country's benefit. It's all for the benefit of the bankers, the elites, the cabal. Uh, it's all for them. If people stopped going to fight for their wars, it would be a major, major problem. Just as I kind of recommended using alternate currencies, if you, especially if you run your own business or self-employed, trying to introduce cryptos for your clients to use, for you to accept payments, whatever. It's also a way of disrupting the current system and catching them off guard, but certainly, don't fight their wars. I mean, who does Washington and the New York elite have the least respect for? It's the Southern Baptists. It's people in the Southern states who are Christian and who are patriotic. They call them hillbillies. They have no respect for them, but they want them to go and fight their wars. You see, the New York elites fighting wars? No. And so those people are doing it because they're very proud and there's this jingoistic and people feel this pride in fighting for the military like it's a great thing, but people need to change their mindset. You are furthering their agendas and it's no good. What did Henry Kissinger say? He said um, people in the army are stupid, dumb animals to be used in as pawns in foreign policy. It's disgusting. He said that. So, you know, you just got to remember. Another thing, great analogy, fighting in the army or going in the war, it's like a man going to the doctor, finding out he has cancer. But instead of addressing his cancer, he gets a gun and goes and shoots other people with cancer. Do you see this going on in war? The enemy is within. Going and shooting up plebs or, you know, <laughs> sorry to use that word, I shouldn't really, but going and shooting out up poor people who've gone into the army in another country, it's not helping anything because the enemy is within. The disease is within most countries, right? So the fighting is just happening at this level and they're all cashing in on that level. So if people refuse to fight, a lot of this could be over because very few wars are actually just. Uh, just to mention, because I'm going to be mentioning Marx and Hegel, um, this whole thing about Marx being pro-labor and pro-labor owning the means of production, absolute rubbish. His whole philosophy was only about driving a wedge between labor and capital, just as they try and drive a wedge between everything as they do a divide and conquer strategy because above capital you have the financiers who really have all the power so making this whole conflict between labor and capital and all the Marxists traditionally supporting the unions it's just to disrupt and destroy economies and to lead people up the garden path and to have their focus in totally the wrong areas so I now want to talk about this article it was fascinating I don't know if I'm going to get through as much of it as I want but I just found it so um, illustrative right so this is basically the final three paragraphs I'm going to do because it's so long it's on the burning platform.com and it's called the evolution of fiat money endless war and the end of citizenship hmm it's all the themes we really need to understand because it's all coming to a head now but it goes back into the history really way back to when money was first invented and was coins and stuff and it talks about how the themes we see now have always been ongoing so it's saying here but at the end of world war ii the privately owned central banks had its total power to issue a withhold credit, set interest rates, etc. And they were now the de facto controllers of state. And they didn't have any threat of objectivity, truth or ethics because no one sees them. They see the puppets and they believe that they've got the power, not the financiers, right? Okay. Um, communism was accepted as a necessary menace to promote the spread of democracy and the US dollar which was financing the creditor class and that's when they began to synthesize Hegel and Marx these philosophers so the University of Chicago in the 1930s funded by guess who John D Rockefeller I mean began this amalgamation of Hegel and Marx which they called the end of history and this is basically what the reset is based on this whole theory so it's not new not new at all and they said most of the world's inhabitants would fight to the death and there would be a resurgence of people they call philosopher kings. These are these people that Elon Musk is going to elevate with all Neuralink and they're going to become almost like Greek gods. 
superheroes, superhumans, transhumans, um, the on a totally untouchable level. And it says here they would be the highest echelon of the creditor, creditor class, the global nobility, and this would be the end of history when economic poverty and so political subjugation were established equally among men. So that's all countries on an equal level. Everyone is equally poor, equally impoverished, equally disenfranchised across the earth. No differences between countries. They said that there would be total political disenfranchisement among the vast hordes of the public and uh, that's the public they say that managed to survive the catastrophic wars needed to achieve this destruction so this was written in the 30s before world war ii and they already got it in their mind catastrophic wars the apocalypse and all this so this is publicly known today as neoconservative the new world order the neoconservative new world order and it's the creditor political class blueprint for their end game total domination of the world with Plato's versions of a completely static society and a bit of justice thrown in. I don't know where the justice is coming from. It's ruled by plutocrats, basically. So key to these machinations of the creditor political class was of this revived end of history is the elimination of sovereign nations. This is a key thing. That's why you see the mass immigration, the breaking down of national identity, the demonization of nationalists etc this is also why they need or everyone in cities because nationalism and patriotism is always associated with more the agrarian parts of the country the rural parts rather than the city parts which have always been very com cosmopolitan and how were they going to destroy nations their insolvency resulting from what the endless endless wars right and they were going to disenfranchise the citizens by a democracy yes well Democracy is, in a way, disenfranchised, just being disenfranchised, because like they say, democracy is two um, wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner, but a republic is where one where sheep has a gun, right? So democracy is actually, we, we always told what a great thing it is, but uh, it's not a good thing, really, because it's majority rule, and if the majority are brainwashed sheep who are totally dumbed down, as we've seen, there's been a massive dumbing down with fluoride in the water and poor education, and, of course, bringing in migrants who, although they may be intelligent, they may not understand the language and the systems of the country, so they're far easier to manipulate in terms of their voting. Mm -hmm. Endless war, that's why they're always egging on war. It's a way to drive countries into total bankruptcy. Now, you see, Putin has only got an 8% deficit, unlike America, whose, who's, not deficit, whose um, percentage of... Um, what uh, debt is way over the GDP in Russia it's only 8% of GDP because they're not going in for all these ridiculous laws wars that's how they brought down the Soviet Union as well with the Afghan war I mean it's and now they're trying to bring down America and the rest of Europe with these endless wars okay so countries are now bankrupt they already are through COVID another way of doing it which we don't mention here so once they're bankrupt because of COVID, they're totally beholden to the privately owned central banks for their funds. And these banks can either withhold credit, they can raise interest rates, they've got their levers on their finger on all the levers of power and they control the media, of course, so they can spin it any way they want. They can then pull interest rates up to unsustainable levels, trigger hyper, hyperinflation, social instability, we and total economic and national collapse, which is what they've done through COVID plus through the mass immigration and the pressure that puts on services and the lack of cohesion and the fighting between different sets of people. Everything they're saying here is exactly what, what they are doing, and you can see it perfectly. And you can see high interest rates, massive cost of living, inflation, all leads to you will own nothing, and you will, and they will be happy, right? <laughs> they got their pronouns wrong, right? You will own nothing, and they will be happy. They will own everything. Someone has to own it. Someone has to own it. Okay, so nations can no longer fund themselves. They struggle to exist among other nations. They can go into failed states. And this is how the world order progresses, by picking up one failed state after another. Okay, one bankrupt nation after another, one bailout after another. Ended wars also have the added benefit of killing a large proportion of the young fighting fit men in the society that eliminates the chance of uprisings and opposition and rebellion. You can also see it's um, dumbing down 
people stuff in the water to make people well the soy boy syndrome let's just call it that you know <laughs> if you want to and also people are fat lazy complacent and dumbing down in the education system a lot of the younger people aren't tuned in and wouldn't want to fight or rise up okay and then they will say the imposition of democracy where maximum participation in voting is promoted and infra enfranchising the likes of illegal aliens, teenagers, the mental to be retarded, I suppose prisoners as well, all that sort of, all manner of people who traditionally wouldn't have had any business deciding the affairs of the country. Well, that we planned in 1930, this, and we absolutely see that happening throughout America. It's their, their the Democrat sort of client voter being brought in and the same thing happening in the UK. It's all to make the democratic process pointless because the people who are voting have no, may have antipathy with the country they are now in or they may have no knowledge of how things are working and therefore are easily swayed by politicians that lie. They all, all lie. This also demoralizes people from participating in the democratic process. I feel that way. I'd never vote again because of two parties don't mean anything anyway and a lot of the population will just give up on the political process it says there so it says one of the economic and social out of this economic and social chaos because of the wars the bankruptcies and everything like that and the giving up of national sovereignty to extra governmental political and financial organizations just because people want stability and security like with COVID, people gave up their rights for stability and security and a guaranteed living wage in many cases that's coming furlough um, these will be provided by the same extra governmental organizations that the creditor and political class has been meticulous to cultivate. So once you've got this suspended sovereignty, an apathetic, uneducated public, there's essentially no more citizenship. It's become worthless. So there's no challenge to the rule of the philosopher kings. They're getting steadily and steadily more and more and more powerful more rich, more away from the problems of the ordinary man and more detached from us um, emotionally as well, in which they have no empathy with us, and we're all getting left behind. Thus, we not only get the end of history, but also the death of citizenship and a return to the subjugation of the medieval period, neo-feudalism and sort of communism as well. So funnily enough, Plato plays a central role in this end of history. So Hegel and Marx talked about the why, but Plato talks about the how, the core tenant in his thought is justice. He said justice was no more than a natural way of things. Survival of the fittest, basically. Strong rule over the weak and the ultimate strength in his system was logic. And under Plato, the small group of the philosopher kings represent the highest order, the most intelligent, possibly the most able, the most scheming, the most well-connected. And they will rule devoid of empathy and make all the decisions based on logic alone. Hence the technocracy, right? The Fauci's and all that uh, communism is ruled by committee. It's technocracy. And that's what they report. Uh, they are talking about here but also they could be meaning as AI because AI would rule with logic alone and would make cool-hearted rational decisions based on numbers and statistics no empathy and of course they're not going to feel empathy for us the same way the lion kills the zebra and feels or the buck and feels no empathy because the lion is entitled he's higher up the food chain the same way we don't always feel empathy well I do actually I'm a vegetarian but a lot of people don't feel necessarily empathy to eat chickens and, and cows and it's the same mentality right according to plato the social system would represent justice in its immutable form right and will usher in a completely static social hierarchy from which no one can escape you see this is the final battle it's armageddon because if they achieve this there's no way ever for us to break out because they've had themselves so enhanced they're at another level. How would we break out? We would have to be so controlled with the AI, with maybe, you know, via medical procedures. People are dumbed down. They're totally controlled. They're under total surveillance. Under China, social credit score becomes increasingly difficult to where it's impossible, hence the end of history, for there to be change. So this is wonderful for them. You can see why they're all working towards this because it, it, it bakes in their control and their power and these so-called philosopher kings whatever they rule over the entirety of humanity which is represented like the all-seeing eye which has nothing to do with omniscience or vigilance hovering above the base of the pyramid but it represents the mass of everyone else under tyrannical rule of an empathy-free logic i.e. ai as well 
all in universal poverty and absolute political franchisement. So it says here we are nearing the end of a 450 year spain um not quite sure where they're getting that but i suppose it's almost how many years more than 450 since martin luther but anyway um in the motives behind what has become the greatest power in the world i think he's kind of intimating that the current illuminati crystallized this plan and began working on it 450 years ago which predates even the rothschild dynasty so there was more before that i think the oppenheimers the Bowers existed before that, the black nobility from Genoa, not black as in colour, so we just call the black nobility. Okay, and they have the power to conjure up their armies out of thin air using credit, you see, where armies come from, credit. The ability to elevate or destroy nations and people by the setting of interest rates in one direction and vanquish armies by the provision or withholding of credit. Who controls the armies, not the weapons, not the fighting? It's the credit because they have to eat, they have to keep the munitions going. It's telling you there. In a fiat money system, all political decisions are not created related to the creation and cost of credit. That's secondary. Pure fiat money is now wholly divorced from labor imports and it is wholly worthless. So profits derived from pure fiat money are illusionary. They have no base, no base unit value determinant. Now he goes on to say here that because um, efficiency was generally seen as reducing labor imports and building and maintaining robots so you could become ever more efficient in the manufacture of transport goods, he says you eventually um, reach a point where imports are removed entirely and the jig is up for money. There's no need for money if all your inputs are robotic. You don't have to pay your worker because your worker's Human beings are now essentially pointless because everything's robotic and AI. So you don't really need money anymore. You don't pay robots, right? The jig is up for money, he says. So what we presently hear about de-industrialization is just fancy talk to describe the ever-increasing industrial efficiency through automation. Thus, the end of growth and the end of money approaches ever nearer with each incremental efficiency gain. And growth cannot be sustained by profitable endeavors nor backed up by labor inputs. Instead, we have increasing illusion of profit by continually removing labor inputs until zero labor is, is reached and all products and things become truly valueless. At the point where money represents zero laborhood, labor input and has no intrinsic value, it's purely now a political tool backed by the enforcers to ensure it's the only medium of exchange and thus can be used to coerce human behavior and to create other value in terms of the new world order. So it's the end of history. Technology triumphs. Human imports are no longer of any value and they control humans through the distribution of money, like universal basic income or withholding of money. So that's why the groundwork is now being laid for digital money, social credit scores and a surveillance state in universal basic income as a way of coercing mass human behavior because technology will be the only thing remaining that possesses some human input and some intrinsic value. So you can understand, you see here, the fusion of the whole AI and, and all this is coming together. It's a fascinating article and I will leave a link so that you guys can have a look over it because, wow, there's so much in there. So really, I think this end of history they're talking about is almost like Armageddon. And they're also talking about this enduring peace. And don't we hear that in Armageddon, there were a thousand years of peace. So I do think that one has to be cautious in some elements of the Bible where, like Revelations, we don't know who's tinkered and who's put things in. And if it's almost a kind of Operation Trust, um, what was that other Q thing? going on in order to lead you up the garden path to accept things which may not be good because they were forecast in the good book and presented as good but we don't know who who edited and put things in and i believe that between uh, 300 and 700 a.d basically islam only came along at the end of that but all the religions were pretty much tampered with and changed by the way i hope the sound is going to be all right on this there's no reason that it should be low so i really hope it's good because some of you mentioned the sound so now, the end of history, there's no need for labor because mainly it's mainly all automated. People have been made redundant. And remember when I did my vlog on Klaus Schwab's Great Reset, he talked uh, lawyers, judges, accountants, insurance brokers, they're all going to be redundant, surgeons even. Well, you know, with total AI and surveillance, would there be any toss up to solve a crime? Everything's going to be monitored and watched. And even now with the NHS, if you're in England, there's a 
look up NHSX, just with the X on end. This is a plan to revamp the whole NHS and to whittle it down to employing a fifth of what it employs now. And most care will take place at home, not in a hospital setting. It's all going to be done remotely. So there'll be no more sort of GP appointments. Most GP tasks will be done by AI. So that's getting rid of them. A lot of the surgeon surgeries will be done by AI. And people will have this hydrogel, which is a kind of graphene oxide technology injected inside of them. DARPA and Max Eigens covered this extensively, this hydrogel. It's a total body surveillance system that can keep tab on uh, uh, emotions, hormones, blood pressure, blood sugar, everything. So that would be your diagnostics, right? The hydrogel in your body. Uh huh. And so even the whole medical thing is moving online. There'll be no need for police because of all the surveillance and tracking everything. People will barely be able to move. So you can see now how many people will be obsolete. So end of labor, end of history means labor is unnecessary. We know now there are no nations. Everyone is equally poor. There has been a, a kind of leveling of the playing field in a bad way because everyone's been brought down rather than bring brought up. And listen, this is where I said, and universal peace, I think this is for a Plato concept, has descended after the conclusion of endless, endless war and total bankruptcy of the fiat system. The citizen soldier and the citizen laborer become unnecessary. So everyone's exhausted. We've had all these wars, everything, minerals, everything exhausted, resources exhausted. And here's where you get your thousand years of peace after the war that's ringing bells about what it says in the Bible. But this is what Plato was advocating. And now this end of history will bring about the end of citizenship because you will have no rights. There's no reason to have democracy or anything. You have no power. You're a dumbed down, virtually an animal. You know, like Kissinger said about the army. Mm. And that other article that I went into with Bill Joy, um, who also talked about these very same concepts of people just being like farmyard animals. But OK, OK, the bulk of humanity will be obsolete. Absolutely, because you've got robots doing most of the things and there'll be the end of work. Yeah, most people are sitting on their bum watching Netflix. That's why you'll need the metaverse and these sort of virtual reality headsets so you can experience everything because obviously you're not allowed to travel and experience it for real. It's like, what's the point of it? And, and, and leave the logical and devoid of empathy philosopher kings no choice but to initiate mass depopulation. Yes, well, they've got no empathy. They make a logical decision and the logic is there are too many people. They're consuming. They have to eat. They're not doing anything. It's logical, not empathetic, to get rid of them, rid of them. And uh, but uh, yes, so the philosopher kings will have no choice but to initiate mass depopulation as not doing so would risk the peace. Oh, God, can't have that and potentially start the revival of history. In other words, we could go back to being humans and back to be normal, which they don't want. So again, it just concludes by saying, you know, when money no longer has value, Profits are illusory and um, it, the money is disimbursed by edict, i.e. universal basic income, to people who are increasingly unnecessary. So money has now transformed from the means of power to power in itself. Society then will devolve into one where many are not only alienated from the means of production, but are now alienated not only from the, me from the means of experiencing a fulfilling existence. So you've got no means of fulfilling your life purpose, having any ambition, having any goals. That's all been taken away from you. What is the point of existence at all? Endeavors related to the pursuit of profit are removed from the power equation. And with the profit motive gone, much of humanity, much of human endeavor, formerly occupied by trade, car, craft and commerce, becomes meaningless. At this point, there's no more need for the philosopher kings to stand on pretense. They can drop this pretense that we're voting and their government and all this. Power in itself becomes their only motivation now, and it's backed up by the perfectly just and logical uh, motivations that they are now kind of carrying everything out. So when peace descends at the end of history, the veneer of past civil society that kept some form of balance in check is permanently effaced. There's no more way to enact justice, to bring, to speak justice to power, to bring about equality. That's all gone. And the rise of the philosopher kings at the end of history will usher in an age of unparalleled violence, barbarism and human meaninglessness that ever declining members of the 
vast number of the 99% under the empathy for illogical will, will yearn for a return to the days of history and to an end of the end of history. So um, I hope they read that okay, but I think you got the gist of it. Uh, I will leave a link. Please take a look. It's absolutely um, fascinating and plays into so much of what is going on now. So please, guys, while we still have power, some power, we have to make a difference. Don't let's sit on our laurels and think, oh, lockdown restrictions. Lockdown is, is one facet of it. It achieves a hell of a lot already, simply because so many people lined up for certain treatments and uh, rules are in place, like all the legislation, which isn't going anywhere. Um, they've had a big, a massive, massive experiment. It's been pretty successful. And uh, but it's also the awakening has been incredibly successful and we have to keep pounding that plus using our ability spending wisely trying to you know use alternate forms of payment whether it be citizen tokens barter crypto let's be imaginative here and uh, let's stay away from mass media their their hands are on the levers of control of that do not support wars do not believe their warmongering um, confront that lie at every alternative because war is only going to harm the little people it's not going to harm them it's going to enrich them let's not fall into any of their traps let's not fall into their divide and conquer either because it's all feeding the monster hope you enjoy that i bloody well hope the sound wasn't crap because you know i haven't changed anything and yet some people said it was rubbish so for those of you who mentioned on rumble that they were unsubscribed yes i found that happen to some people i'm subscribed to on rumble so it's really crazy. So obviously Rumble is not as, um, you know, pucker as we thought. Isn't that so? And just a little note, guys, in a few weeks, I'm going to be fronting up another astrology channel, but I'll be not doing my own stuff. There'll be no political stuff. It'll be kind of stuff that's that I am asked to present. I think it's quite an exciting thing. It'll all just be astrology, lots of love stuff. I'm quite excited. I think I can do a good job of it. But as I say, it won't be my own channel. So if you do see me there, and I will probably invite you to go and have a little look over there for that kind of fluffy astrology stuff. If you see me there, then you know what that is. You know that I am fronting up this other channel as their kind of resident expert. So thanks for that. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys are all doing okay on this rainy, rainy February day. Have a happy Valentine's Day.